if it could be saved they call it the hill country i call it home but what will we call it when it's level and pay presenter is uh, Penny Pepperly, and I'm going to load her presentation now. experience in public accounting, business consulting, private industry, and uh, she's a part of BDO and is going to share with us a very important topic about how do we pay for this. This is an important issue that we hear about all the time as uh, you are aging or your parents are aging and you look at the bank account and look at how much this costs and you put the two together and see that they don't always match up. So we're very pleased to have Penny. Let's welcome her to the stage.
do have long-term care insurance, I suggest that you contact your provider and make sure it covers Alzheimer's disease. Not all policies do cover that. There is a thing called reverse mortgage. We're not going to talk about it because it really should be a last resort. Um, if somebody has a question, I'll be happy to answer that. But the assessing your personal resources and um, sources of income is critical once you know that you have Alzheimer's. I'm going to click through some slides here that don't really pertain. Um, we're going to come back to this one. So, talking about resources, if someone is 65 years of age and has Alzheimer's, they are eligible for Medicare. They should automatically be enrolled, and it's a government insurance program that's age-based, and everyone who is 65 years of age is eligible. eligible. And there's also Medicaid. Now, that's a little different, and it's needs-based, so you have to get on the Medicaid website, you have to assess if you're eligible for that benefit. So why is it important to know the difference in what your benefits are? Well, Medicare basically covers your uh, necessary physical needs in inpatient hospital services. It covers your physician care services. It covers home health and skilled nursing, but only short term. So if you um, have a hip replacement and you need to go to a nursing home for rehabilitative care, it will cover that for up to 30 days. But the important thing to know is Medicare does not cover long-term care. It will not pay for a nursing home um, for your loved one. So Medicaid, on the other hand, does. But 
what, what financial resources do you have? Not just current income, social security, but where are their bank accounts? Where are their investment accounts? What type of property do they own? All of these things will be very important because at some point down the road, someone will need to have power of attorney over those resources. And you're gonna to wanna to know what your loved one's wishes are as to how to utilize those resources. So make a list of insurance policies, not only health, but also for property owned, for long-term care, life insurance. What, what do they have available? Look at their monthly expenditures. What are they currently paying in the monthly bills? How is that going to change as the years go along with the um, impact of the Alzheimer's disease? Where can you um, go for resources as you put together this plan, this financial plan? Well, one great place is ALZ.org. If you have not been to the Alzheimer website, there's a wealth of information out there, and they actually have a caregiver um, section, which has another subsection called planning for cost. So if you go, you can, they have a lot of information about the cost of the disease. They also have some tools to help you accumulate the information of what your monthly expenditures are, what, the, what your monthly income is, and what it's going to be down the road. Other resources, I um, can pass the slide, but it's um, eldercare.gov. So you go to www.eldercare.gov. There's um, a wealth of resources there. Elder care attorneys to help you set up wills, powers of attorney. Make sure your loved one's assets are handled properly. Um, also, um, Solaris has some bridge loan information um, on their table over here. Uh, we talked about reverse mortgage being a last stop resort. I would definitely check out their information on bridge loans if you need immediate funds <coughs> as you're trying to care for a person versus the reverse mortgage. Um, does anybody have questions about, I know it's usually not a topic that you want to discuss, but the specific questions about how to gather the information and what resources you might have available? Thank you all very much for having me, and uh, feel free to go to the website. Thank you very much, Penny. Uh, we have one more speaker before we move into lunch. Marcus, come on up here. This is Marcus Mercer, and Marcus is the Director of Life Engagement for uh, Sedala Senior Living, and as I told our folks on our conference call yesterday with all of our communities, uh, probably no one person has had a greater impact on what actually goes on uh, in a day-to-day -day basis in our communities more than Marcus, uh, as he has kind of in charge of the engagement and how we uh, respond to and, and uh, deal with our residents and treat them with dignity and respect. Uh, Marcus is also about to graduate from the uh, Dementia and Aging Studies program at Texas State with his master's degree in December? In May. In May. So we're very proud of that as well. So we're talking about this. All right. Thank, can you guys hear me? Yes. All right. So um, let me go ahead and say thank you for letting me be here today. My background as a recreation therapist has allowed me to work with a number of different populations based off of a number of needs. In 2007, I wouldn't have imagined I'd be here where I'm at today. And what I'm going to talk to you guys about today is really what I've learned in school, but more so what I've learned about the people that we help take care of. And I can talk to you about numbers and research all day long, but to be honest, I know you can get it. You can get that today from everybody else. So I'm going to talk to you about five simple things that can probably help you 
overcome a lot of barriers that um, that we see as engagement. It's only five things, so I'll try to keep it keep it simple for you. Uh, what I'll ask you first is think about what you view engagement as. A lot of times we confuse it for activities, and that's not necessarily the case. So I'm not going to talk to you about activities per se, but from the sense of engagement, your relationship. You know, if an activity is doing something, think about the process of getting it done, whatever it is. So if you're in a facility, if you are at home, whether you're an informal caregiver or a professional, we all have relationships we have to build. And that doesn't change for the person that has dementia. And so right now we look for the magic pill, we look for a lot of things to fix it, but along the way, again, think about what is that like for you, more so for that person that has dementia. Um, so that's what we'll go with. So the five things, Marx's top five things, Try to make the form easy for you on the back. You can follow along with me. The five things that I've seen that become your biggest barriers that come over the environment, the activity, the way we communicate, the sense of independence, and the relationship. I'm going to keep coming back to the relationship because if a person doesn't have trust, if I don't trust you, I don't feel safe. If I don't feel safe, how are we going to get whatever it is we got to get done? And so that's the thing that I really want you to, to leave with when it comes to a good relationship because what April talked about in her presentation and what Dr. Johnson talked about, you will see a lot of overlap. What I'm hoping to do is that we kind of, um, it ties right back into the same thing. So think about your environment. I'm not talking about just the physical piece, but I'm talking about that person. Think about the eyes and the lens that they look through when they see an environment. Think about the time of day. Some of your people, some of you, who, who here has worked third shift before? Not everybody can do that. But you think about the person that's all their life, they've always worked third shift. Their clock operates on that. And a lot of times we have to remember that. Um, we try to have them uh, accommodate us and our routine and the way we operate and the reality of the time of day and whatever it is that you're working on may not match where they're at today. Uh, it may be too much light. It may not be enough light when you think about the environment. It may be too noisy. It may be too many people. All these things when you think about the environment are things in which you should take into consideration as you have this relationship with a person that has this. Does the environment mirror a past um, from what they have? So I'm going to go back to knowing that much more about that resident because a lot of times residents will lose, and I say residents or persons with dementia, sometimes that ability to differentiate between what was and what is, sometimes our loved ones lose that. Uh, they have that as like, as if type factor. So this setting at dinner, I'm sitting at the table with a group of people, and I've always led a company. It's no longer dinner to me. I'm conducting business. You know? And sometimes these environments now mirror certain things from my past. And I, I may not have the ability to tell you that this is like a situation we and this now becomes that. And if we're not conscious of that environment that that resident is in sometimes, we can make them feel terrible about it or we can deny them the setting in which they're operating and what's most comfortable to them. So please be conscious of the environment at times. Um, early, early learned behaviors and memories stick. So again, what, what April talked about when she, these tables here were, were for April's brain, right? You think about them. Some memories stick, some don't, but the ones that have been there the longest sometimes, they may be a little fuzzy, but they're still there. So it's important to know that learn, early learned behaviors and memories do stick for a person that has dementia, even though our thought is they lose their memory. Alzheimer's and dementia isn't always just about the memory, um, their memory. So, there are a lot of things they do lose along the way, but sometimes it's important to know their early learned behaviors and routines do stick. Uh, last thing, when it comes to the environment, be familiar with their routine. Uh, going, uh, going back to what's convenient for me doesn't always mean that it's convenient for that resident. And, it, and that is a challenge, especially when you're caring for somebody at home. But think about the ways in which you can adjust your routine to accommodate them. <laughs> How many people in here are early risers when it comes to starting your day? Who in here starts their day after 10 o'clock? So 
people do. It's important to know that. How many people need um, coffee to start their day? I'm not a coffee drinker, but I have to remember that about some people. You know, so it's important to know the routine of that resident, regardless if they're able to communicate it to you or not, but it's important to know that. That can make a world of a difference in the relationship that you might have. So the activity. Sometimes we have to keep in mind, whether, where, regardless of whatever the activity is, um, the level of interest in it. If the ability, a mat, the ability of the resident matches the level that it takes to complete the activity. Sometimes it's thought that if the activity is too difficult, I could be easily discouraged. It's easy for me to tell you I don't want to do it versus show that I can't do it. Um, for sometimes, if, it's, uh, if the activity is a little too difficult for a person, then you're setting me up for failure. So you really have to find that balance when it comes to matching that level of ability. Sometimes if the activity taps into your past and different interests, a person that might have been a mechanic, they might be under the bed all day fixing a car. To us, it looks like they're from under the bed, but it's important to know what it was that that person's um, past was. Um, the woman that worked in the kitchen, worked for uh, kids all her life at the cafeteria. She may not ever want to do an activity per se, but finding a role for her to where she could still fulfill what her past was, such as helping out in the kitchen, something that we're already doing, but it's things that we don't look at as a, as a type of activity. And is there an end result? For some people, what's the purpose of it? I don't have time to play. As an older adult, I, I didn't get that opportunity. I have to work. And so now when you present something to me, regardless of what it is, it looks like it's child's play. But if you're able to kind of entice me into doing it, and there's a purpose behind it, such as uh, we're making pillows for kids in need, or we're baking cookies, because I see uh, the jars that we made, and Elon has cookies over there making. You know, we want to serve, and we want to take care of, we want to do things for people. And a lot of times people are willing to do things for other people. If you think about a generation, a lot of times we put others before ourselves. So those are things you want to take into consideration when it comes to the activity. And did you make advanced preparation? Too many times, whatever the activity is, we want to get a person to it, and then go get all our supplies and everything that we need. And by the time you go get it and you come back, what's happening? So help yourself out because that becomes frustrating for you too, but you can imagine the frustration that you might have as you're going to go get that person. They could probably see your frustration. So that's a lose-lose situation. They may not ever do it, but if you help yourself out and have it in advance, um, you're more likely to be able to succeed. Now. Communication. There's a UCLA professor that did a study back in 81. And he looked at the way in which we communicate and how we receive communication. 7% of what we communicate is heard in our words. Uh, about 38% is heard in our inflection and our tone. 55% is in our body language. Also, the facial expressions. And so, a lot of times we get caught up in what the person is actually saying in the words. And as Dr. Johnson said, a lot of things that people say may not be actually what they're intending. So keep that in mind because the majority of communication ain't coming from words. It's coming from your body language. So think about what you might be presenting to that loved one as you're communicating to them. Because when I'm frustrated, you can still see what frustration looks like. When I'm happy, you can see what happy looks like. When I'm sad, you can go on and on about that. But the same thing happens with our residents, so you have to look at those things too, because if they lose the ability to communicate, you have to start picking up on them, the nonverbal cues as well. So, ABCs, check your ABCs. All behaviors communicate. You haven't heard that before? Think about it. Think about what is it that your loved one is trying to tell you. So when I say all behaviors communicate, Dr. Johnson talked about constipation. <laughs> you can't tell somebody you constipated and you haven't had bowel movement in over four days. How do you think you're going to feel? Okay. You got an ingrown toenail. If you're in pain, maybe you're missing somebody. You know, maybe you're lonely. Maybe you no longer have purpose. Because I've had a number of residents that say, I've hired, I fired people, I put four kids through school, I worked all my life, I don't have anything else to do.
What am I sitting here for? What is God still keeping me here for? What's the answer to that? Again, all behaviors communicate. And sometimes the behavior can be a negative, and sometimes it can be a cry out for some type of help. And then I also want to make sure that you know, recognize the symbols that the symbols that our loved ones do use at times. So going back to that loop that Dr. Johnson referenced, where people go back and they go forth in that continuum. Sometimes these things don't always have the same meaning to us. So for a lot of women, for example, purse is what? What is some, what does a purse symbolic go to women? Possession. It should catch all, what else? Well, the person has dementia, even though that person might only have toilet tissue in it, doesn't matter, it's mine, because that purse represents me as a woman. Or for the guy, the wallet, the keys, even though there's nothing in it. The hallway, that becomes, it's not, it's not just a hallway anymore, it's a street. The buggy that a person's walking with is a car. The dining room, where this is taking place is a meeting of some sort, and something important is about to take place. Um, I talked about the lady who might be under the bed who's fixing her car. You know, how do you go back and correct that? You got to think about the ways in which symbols are used for people, and that also goes to people. You may have been the low one. You have dark hair. You look like that lady that was my teacher. That could be a good or bad thing. <laughs> don't know if you hit me with ruler, because if you did, regardless of how nice you are to me, I don't like you. And I may not have the ability to tell you why I don't like you, I now respond to you that way. So every day, when you come to give me my shower, we're going to have a fight. So it's important to know the way, uh, know the different ways in which symbols are used and the way that a president uses them. Um, the person is able to look at that, it's going to be you. Is it frustrating when you pull your hair out? Probably, because you may not ever really know. But the point is, is that you're looking at it from a different scope. Independence. One, relax the rules. A lot of times we have a way in which we want things done the way that we want them done. That doesn't always work for the person that has the mission. So you take, let's say we go out to eat, you get a suit. The resident, you order a soup for the resident. The resident picks up a fork and they try to eat it. You as a loved one, you want to see them do right. You don't want to see them embarrass themselves, so you constantly correct them. You constantly correct them, you're verbally saying it. I guarantee you that loved one, whether they respond to it immediate, immediately, can see the frustration that you have with them in that. And imagine what that does to them internally. Does it have to be right? Is there another way in which you can subtly um, reapproach that? Of course. A game, for example, you don't have to play by rules. A lot of times, loved one was a domino player. They don't play by the rules anymore, so we don't play dominoes. <laughs> Is that the case? No, we can actually still utilize the dominoes, but use it in different ways. So sometimes, think about the, rule, the way that you use rules no longer apply to the person that has dementia, and that's okay. Sometimes you have to leave things half done, and that's setting the person up for success sometimes. Again, we want to correct, but set your residence and your loved ones up sometimes for success. So it might be a puzzle, it might be some woodwork, and you intentionally leave it out because you know they may do it, but you kind of gave them a head start when it comes to it. Um, the last thing I want to talk to you about with my time is the relationship. Be an empathic listener. And I'm not talking about, listen, again, listening to words, but listen to their body language, match it. Sometimes you can tell the intensity in which a person is talking to you with. You can tell when they're happy and when they're sad. You should be able to look at the rise and fall of the chest as a person is talking to you. You can tell when a person is worried and anxious. You can tell when a person wants to go home with that's life for them. Whether you know exactly what it is, you can put yourself in a position of when you felt like X, Y, and Z. You know what happiness feels like. You know what grief feels like. All you have to do is put yourself in that in a time when you feel like that and your emotions will begin to match up with a person. Allow enough time for a response for people. And again, go back to thinking about how well do you know them? 
there's some things that we've been taught to suppress, and some things we don't talk about, some things we don't learn about, and that happens with this generation particularly. What happened in the house stayed in the house, or you were viewed upon negatively if you went and talked to a professional back in the day. But now, when residents lose their ability to filter things, they come out. And we don't know if it's true or what. So it's more important to really talk about things that sometimes are uncomfortable and be willing to share those things because when it comes up, the way these symbols and the way that I move and the way that I talk now may make sense. Because if I had a relationship prior to my wife and nobody ever knew about it, she had an abortion. And now I grieve for a child that I didn't have a say in. But you didn't know anything about that. How can you help me do that? And those are things to know and to think about. Relationships really come down to friendships. And um, Bill and Troxel had a book called uh, The Best Friends Approach to Alzheimer's back in 97. And he talked about a few elements when it comes to a relationship, a friendship. And to be a friend, really, is to think about the way you, you know a person and know their personality. We build each other's self-esteem. We laugh. We actually laugh a whole lot. We work together. We do things together. I don't just do it for you. We do it together. You know, these are these are things when it comes to friendship. Regardless of what our relationship used to be and what it is, we can build a relationship. And you have to be willing to look at that on a day-to-day, -day, moment moment basis. So it's, it's easier said than done, but you have to be willing to look at it that way. To help you really tie that back up for the time, I'm going to leave you with a good quote Maya Angelou shared with us. She said that people often will forget what you said and what you did, but they don't forget how you made them feel. And the resident that is now no longer able to verbally communicate with you and able to give you different responses, it shouldn't change the way in which you treat them and um, engage with them. You know how you as an individual want to be treated. Nobody wants to be cast with the stigma that comes along with having an Alzheimer's dementia. Nobody wants that stigma that comes along with just being an older person. Woman, black, white, nobody wants that stuff. So it's, it's that much more conscious to think about the way in which you make the person feel. Uh, I'd be more than happy to talk to anybody afterwards. If you uh, are coming across some different barriers for your loved ones or either in your community, uh, put brains on which that's what I'm here for. That's what I get a chance to do in our communities. And so with that, that is it for my presentation. And if you guys have any questions, here it is. Anybody? All right. Thank y'all. Thank you, Marcus. Uh, now it is time for lunch. And uh, we're going to do a working lunch today. So I'm going to introduce Brian to you in just a moment to tell you a little bit more about uh, our lunch. But after you go through the line and get your food, get your drink, come on back to the table. And we're uh, going to have Jenny Funk coming up in just a moment uh, to talk to us during lunch. So uh, don't take too much time. Just go through the line. And, and this is uh, Brian. And he has Brian's on 290. Uh, and Brian and I used to work together. He was the executive chef of one of my communities and was the uh, culinary director for a company I used to be with, and he's a great partner of ours, and I wanted him to be able to introduce lunch to you today. How's everyone doing? You hungry? Yeah, just a little bit? Okay. All right, what we have today for lunch, uh, there's, there's two box lunches. One of them is, the first one is a strawberry feta spinach salad with toasted almonds and a lime light chipotle raspberry dressing. It's not too spicy, but it does have a little bit of heat to it. Nothing too bad. Um, then the next dish is a grape chicken salad with pecans, and it's on wheat berry bread. The side dish on that is uh, slow roasted squash with a uh, garlic confit truffle infused oil, light salt, pepper, and tomatoes. Uh, so I hope you guys like that, and uh, without any further ado, that's it. And, uh, thanks, Sean. That's why I had to I want to just say there's a sandwich over there. So let's go ahead and get up and get through the line and come back to your tables.
What will we call it when it's level and pain? Civilized pagans 